Hello and welcome to session one of the SimScale Biomedical Engineering Workshop. In session one we're going to talk about the fundamentals of biomedical engineering and introduce you to engineering simulation. My name is Anna and I'm the Academic Program Manager at SimScale. I'm, uh, today I'm filling in for my colleague Milad who is feeling a little bit sick today. So a little bit about me, as I said, I'm the Academic Program Manager at SimScale. So I focus on working with students and educators who are interested in SimScale as well as delivering training. So let's uh, get started with the agenda for today. So we're going to start out by talking about the fundamentals of engineering simulation. And then after that, I'll introduce uh, biomedical engineering. Then we'll go into a live demonstration. So the live demonstration will be um, an analysis of a hip prosthesis. We're going to look at the stresses and, and displacements um, under a, a load that's applied, a walking load. Then we're going to wrap up the session with key learnings, uh, a homework assignment, and a question and answer session if you have questions. And if you have questions at any time during the session, feel free to um, ask them in the question box uh, in this GoToWebinar application, and I will look at them as they come in. Um, and a final thing to note is this session is being recorded, and it will be sent to you via email after, after today's live session if you want to watch it again. So what you will learn in this session, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of, or in the in the workshop in general. We're going to talk about biomedical engineering and the latest technology trends. So, and we're also going to relate this to simulation. So, how to use FEA and CFD for biomedical applications. In today's session, we're going to we're going to talk about a hip prosthesis. In the second session next week, we'll talk about a stent, and then in the third session, we're going to talk about fluid uh, blood flow through an artery. And overall, we're going to visualize and analyze the simulation results in each session. So you learn how to do the simulation and to visualize and understand the results. Now, the format of this workshop is a series of three online webinar sessions, one each week. There will be three associated homework assignments. These are optional. But um, by doing the homework, we feel that you really learn how to apply uh, what you've learned in these sessions, and you will qualify for a certificate of completion for the course. And this can be added on a resume or on LinkedIn. So what is engineering simulation? Engineering simulation, it's, it's a very broad term, but it's a usage of computer software to aid in engineering analysis tasks. So um, just like we have CAD, so we can we have computer aided design where we can draw our models. Um, we also have computer computer aided engineering where we can um, analyze and test our models in a virtual environment. And there are a number of subsections uh, to simulation. So we have finite element analysis, which is where we um, we, look at, we want to look at the stresses or displacements. Um, so for example, we have a skull impact um, of a bicyclist wearing a helmet. We can better understand how this helmet is protecting the skull and also what forces are, are going to be acting on the skull in, in, the, in the case of an impact. The next branch is computational fluid dynamics, so CFD. Um, an example of this would be blood flow through an artery, which we'll talk about in session three. And so finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics, these are the two, uh, the two big topics. And then smaller topics include thermal analysis, multibody dynamics, and optimizations. And in this biomedical workshop, we're going to focus on FEA and CFD. Now let's just quickly go through the benefits of using, of using simulation. So we're not just using simulation for fun. Um, there's really a, a big benefit to it. It reduces the time it takes to uh, design, you know, for example, a biomedical engineering device. Um, it reduces the number, number of physical prototypes that you need to build. 
uh, which also reduces cost, and you can really virtually test your design before you build anything. So you can test the design, you can see if it's correct, you can see if it's efficient um, before you build anything. So it's it's a very useful it's very useful in the early design phases. Great. So that was the introduction to engineering simulation. Um, now let's go into what biomedical engineering is. And here on this slide you'll, you'll find a, a, a definition of, of what it is, but I think the main thing to point out is biomedical engineering is really, it's a broad field, um, but it's also very cross-disciplinary. So you have uh, doctors, biologists, en engineers who are really working together to figure out ways to improve human health either through um, technology or prosthetic devices, implants, um, and things like that. And so let's talk. Let's now talk about the areas of biomedical engineering. So again, this is very broad. Um, we can start here with biomechanics, which is kind of what we're going to be looking at today. This is more more engineering, I would say, more similar to mechanical engineering. Um, but biomechanics would involve any sort of implants or prostheses. Um, so today we're going to talk about a hip implant. Um, then we also have biomaterials. So um, especially for medical applications, biomaterials obviously need to be non-toxic and they need to uh, work well within the body and not be rejected by the body. Clinical engineering, uh, tissue engineering, um, so here you can see a rat that has an ear uh, kind of growing on it. Um, so different applications here. This is more um, more maybe biology uh, type applications. Bioinstrumentation and medical imaging. So medical imaging would be your MRI, uh, CT scans, x-rays, things, things like this. So not actually things that are in the human body, but uh, applications that help us to understand the human body better. And let's look at some biomedical engineering milestones. So these start pretty early in 1600 with uh, Galileo inventing the thermometer, which is obviously anytime you go to the doctor, they might take your temperature if you're feeling sick. Um, up to the 19th century with the, the x-ray, um, which is now a, a very widely used technology, uh, the iron lung. And even closer to today's times, uh, this prosthesis uh, hip implant uh, has, was developed in the 1940s. Um, this is becoming more and more common for people that have uh, problems with their hip. Uh, getting these, these type of implants, it's safe, a safe technology nowadays. Um, dialysis, so the ability to clean the blood if the kidneys don't work correctly. Um, heart valves, stents, things like this. And so in, in this biomedical engineering workshop, we're going to focus on uh, three of these applications, uh, the prosthesis, blood flow through a heart, uh, or an artery rather, and this stent design. So now let's go into today's, into today's uh, topic, which is uh, hip replacement. We're going to talk about a, a hip implant. Um, and let's start with just talking about the anatomy of, a hip, of the hip. Um, so basically what the hip is doing is it's allowing, you, you know, it's attaching your, your legs to your body. It's allowing movement of your legs. It's giving you that three degrees of freedom, which you enjoy. Um, Obviously, it, it, it's limited, so it, it's not a full range of motion. And as you get older, that range of motion will decrease. If we go in a little bit closer, we can kind of get a better view of what it looks like. So we have the femoral head, which is there's a layer of cartilage there, which kind of allows the hip to rotate smoothly. Uh, so this is connecting to your, your femur and your, your pelvis, which is giving you that, that range of motion that allows you to walk and jump and run.
Now, in some instances, um, this can be uh, an athletic injury, maybe from playing football or um, just aging. You can sometimes get a breakdown of, of the cartilage in this hip joint, and if it becomes very, very painful, um, sometimes it's, it's necessary to have a hip joint replacement surgery. This is kind of a, a last, uh, last ditch effort. Um, there's a lot of non-invasive non treatments that can be done first, um, but once the pain becomes too much and, and there's no more non-invasive non treatments, then it's time to do the hip joint replacement surgery. And so this, this, is a, a, this is an image on the left of a hip joint prosthesis, um, and this is, what is, this is what's being used to replace a damaged hip joint. Generally, these are made out of either metal um, or certain types of plastic and ceramic. It, it kind of depends on the model that you're using. And what we can do and what we're going to do in today's session is we're going to understand how the forces are, what, what forces are being applied to this hip uh, joint prosthesis and how, the, and how those forces are being uh, put on the bone or the femur. And let's get a little bit closer look at the replacement anatomy. So again, you can see the implant here on the left. Maybe I can use a pointer. So you can see here, this is the implant. Oh, sorry. This is the implant stem, and then there's a head. And then we have bone around this. So we have the cortical bone, trabecular, and then bone marrow here. Now, the way the, the load moves through the body is, is quite interesting, and this is uh, known as Wolf's Law. So basically what happens is when loads are applied to your body, um, your bones will adapt. So if the loads somehow change, if the weight of your body changes, your bones um, will adapt to different loads under which that's placed. And, and what it's doing is, you can see here, we have normal stresses. Generally, the body load is applied directly on the hip. And so on this side of the bone, we have compressive stresses. And on this side of the bone, we have tension stresses. And this will be important. Um, this, this, uh, the, way, the way the forces move through the bone will become important later when we look at the results. And, and basically, what can happen is if you, when you have a normal, when you have your, your normal uh, layout of the body, um, the stresses are equally distributed on, on, this, on this bone, this femur bone. Um, and, your, and your body will obviously adjust, so the, the density of the, the bone in your body is adjusted to how, how the load is. But what can happen is, when you have an implant, as we see here, it changes the load path. And so more of the load, um, because we find that these implants are, if they're made out of metal, for example, they are stiffer than bone. And so more of the load will be absorbed by this um, implant and less will be going to, to the actual bone itself. And so we get this, uh, thing, this, this concept called stress shielding. And this is the reduction of bone density um, as a result uh, of stress being removed from the bone. And this can happen, um, and this does happen with, with implants. So more, more of the, the compressive force is being taken by the implant and less is being passed on to the bone. And so the bone starts to weaken and, and loses strength. So you actually will start to lose bone in your leg. Okay, so we just discussed uh, stress shielding, and so now we're going to go into our um, main application topic today, and I'm going to describe a little bit of how the setup works. So again, we can see our bone, um, and then 
So we have the, the, main, the main thing to focus on here is the materials that are being used. Um, so the implant in this case will be made out of metal. It's going to have uh, the head will be made out of cobalt chromium alloy. The stem is going to be titanium aluminum alloy. And then these bone structures uh, will have different uh, varying uh, properties. And so it's important to notice that obviously here we have the Young's modulus and this is a, this is a factor of stiffness. And so you can see here that the metal alloys are, are very stiff compared to our bone structures. And the second thing to talk about is the boundary conditions of how, how, we, how we look at the loads on this. So we basically have it fixed at the base and then we apply loads here on the head. And so force one is a hip contact force. So this is the forces on your hip when you're walking. And we can actually see these here in this graph, um, the variation of how, how the hip or how the force is applied on the hip due to walking. So that's the first, the, this, this force number one. Force number two is a constant load. It's the body weight of the person, so around 836 newtons for an average uh, human would be uh, the weight that will be applied on this, this hip. Okay, so those were the main, that was the main theory that will be covered, and now we're going to switch over to the live demonstration. And so first I want to talk a little bit about how the simulation setup works with these three steps. So the first thing that, that we do on the SimScale platform is you need, and when you do simulation in general, is you need to import your CAD model. So um, you can, I mean, this CAD model, I'm not sure where it was generated, but it needs to be uh, uploaded first to the SimScale platform, uh, clean and simplified. Um, so removing any small faces or, or things uh, is, is the first step. The second step is setting up the simulation. And so that means, just as I showed you in the previous slide, you need to apply your materials, you need to, uh, and, and then apply the loads and the fixed boundary condition as shown. And then in the final step, which this is the most interesting step obviously, is to look at the results and try to learn um, you know, how these loads are affecting the hip. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to the SimScale workbench which I hope you can see my screen right now. So this is the SimScale workbench. As you can see, I'm working in my, my web browser. I'm in the Chrome web browser. Um, so I'm doing everything online right now. Um, I'm, in, I'm in the SimScale workbench. So uh, the first thing to do is upload the hip joint prosthesis, which I've already done. I can see it in the viewer. I can rotate it, zoom in and out. And let's have a look at the different uh, solids that we have here. So you can see the head, which is solid four. Then we have the, the stem here, the implant stem. This is solid three. This is the cortical bone that I just, that I just hid. This bone right here is the cortical bone. Then we have in the blue, we have the bone marrow. And then finally here, the trabecular. And so there are five components that make up this, uh, this model. And now the next step, what we want to do is we need to mesh this. And so what meshing is doing is it's breaking down our geometry into smaller elements. And if I zoom in, you can see all these small elements that, that this geometry is made up of now. And what, why we do this is because we're, we're using numerical methods to solve for the stress and displacement in this case. And we can't just do that over the whole body, over a continuous body. We need to break it down into smaller elements. And we generate a very, very large system of uh, algebraic equations that, that can be solved on a, on a computer. 
And so for each of these elements, we're solving for each of these elements will have nodes um, on their at their at their on the points. And this is where we're actually solving for the displacements, um, which allows us to find the stresses uh, and strains um, when a load is applied to this model. And just to give you a quick overview, you'll learn all this in if you do the step-by-step -step tutorial and the homework that it will be shared with you later. You'll you'll get to set up this up by yourself. Um, so I'm just going to kind of do an overview of how the steps work. I'm not going to uh, fully fully show everything. Um, but if I go to operation one, we can see uh, the settings for this mesh. So this is a TET dominant mesh, which is generally what we're using for finite element analysis, where we're trying to solve for the stress and the strain. I'm using an, the automatic meshing algor algorithm. Sim, SimScale has this, so it makes it very easy to create a nice mesh. Uh, moderate fineness, and then I'm using eight computing cores to solve for this. And so this mesh, I created this in about five minutes, I think. Um, so that's all the time it took. So now once the, the, the mesh is complete, the next step is to set up the simulation, which is what I'm going to show you right now. And so basically what can be done is you're provided with this tree. So it, it gives you all the steps that you need to fill in. And, and it can look a little bit overwhelming, but it's quite easy once you go through it. It, it really, if you go, click on every single item in this tree and you fill in the information, then you've correctly set up your model. And so the first thing that needs to be chosen is the analysis type, which in this case is static. Since we're just applying and we can have a look here. So it's nice in SimScale, it gives you a description of what static is. So in this case, we want to determine the displacements and stresses um, on this structure. So we're going to use a, a static load or a static analysis type. Now the next thing that we need to talk about is contact. So as I showed you earlier, this model has five, it, it's contained of, it contains five different solids. And on SimScale and when you're doing FEA, the solver doesn't know that these volumes are connected to each other unless you tell it that they're connected to each other. So we have to set up, um, we have to set up the contacts. And I have this actually in my slides, which might be easier to see. And so this is what we're, we're doing. So if we first look at um, the implant stem and the head, we can see here that we need to attach, so these faces of the head need to be attached to these faces of the stem. And we'll do this by using a master and a slave face. So basically what the master face is doing is the master face, all the nodes, when those mo nodes move, they're connected to the slave nodes, and the slave nodes must follow the movement of the master. And so that's how um, these contacts are working. And right now we're setting up contacts that are, that are bonded contacts, so it's basically like we're gluing these two uh, components together. And we're going to do this for the remaining of, of the faces, so we have to make sure all the parts are connected. So the first is the head and the stem. And now we can see the stem also needs to be connected to the trabecular here. Uh, maybe it's easier to see here. So the stem needs to be connected to the trabecular and part of the marrow here, all the way down into this section. Then we have the trabecular and the marrow. So uh, get the pointer again. So this red section here needs to be attached to this green section, which is the marrow, and we do that at the interface where they meet. So you can see here, this is where our contacts will be set up. And then finally, the marrow and the trabecular need to be connected to the outer bone, the outer cortical bone. And so with all those set up, our whole system is connected, everything is glued together, 
and now our solver knows that we want um, we want everything to be connected. And so if I go back to the workbench, we can actually see this as well. Let me change this to surfaces. So if I zoom in here, you can see the master faces of the of the head are attached to the slave faces of this stem. And it's the same throughout the whole uh, the whole implant. We can see the contacts that have been created. So this is between the trabecular and the marrow. And then this is the cortical and the trabecular and the marrow are connected here. Okay, so the next the next step when we go down the tree is materials. And in this case we're using metal materials. So the, the head and the, fem and the stem of the implant are going to be metal alloys. And so the main, the main things that need to be, the, the main information that needs to be given in this case is the Young's modulus, which is again the stiffness of the material, the Poisson's ratio, and the density of the material. That's all that needs to be provided um, for, for the model to be working correctly. And so again, we have to do these. Each volume has a different material, so we have to set up each volume separately with the provided material. Once that's done, the next step is we can skip these initial conditions. We don't need them in this case. We just can go directly to the boundary conditions. And so the first boundary condition, as we, as we discussed, is we have to fix this in place. So if you look at the bone right now, it's kind of just floating. You know, it, it needs to be fixed at some point. And so since we're applying the load at the head, we're going to fix it far away so it doesn't um, skew the stresses per se. And so we'll fix it down here at the bottom. These two faces will be completely fixed. Um, and so there, the, uh, the elements and nodes there are not allowed to move at all. Now if we go to the loads, you can remember that we were applying a walking load, so imagining how the forces are transferred to the hip when a person is walking, and you know this will vary. So um, when your foot hits the ground, this is when you're going to experience the largest load in the hip um, versus when your, your foot is in the air. And the way this is applied is I showed you a graph of, of the variable load, and we can apply this as a table, which is what we've done here. So you can actually see um, we have time. And this is not really time in this case. It's more just uh, different steps, um, for example. And then we have the load in the x direction, y direction, and z direction. And so that's how the variable load is set up. And this, again, will all be explained uh, in, in very good detail in the uh, homework that I will send you after the session. And then the second load is the body weight load. And so this is applied in the downward direction. And this is just uh, 836 newtons, so about the, the average weight of a, of a, of a person. And so that's the main, uh, the main setup, and the final, the final couple steps involve um, setting up the simulation control, um, number of computing cores, and the runtime. So this, this example that I'm showing you right now takes about 100 minutes to run, um, since we want to see how uh, the, the, the hip will, the forces vary on the hip over time or over, over the time steps that are provided, we give an interval of 100, and so every 10 uh, is, we'll have, we'll have 10 steps shown uh, in the final, final results. And then the last thing to do is run the simulation, which you can see I've already done. Um, and again, it took about 100 minutes to run. And so that's the that's the main uh, overview in the SimScale workbench of how this of how this works. So I'm going to go back to my presentation and
we'll discuss a few things before we look at the results. So before we look at this, the results, I want to talk about principal stress, stress, and this is 3D principal stress. So if you see right now, we have um, on this cube, you can see we have nine directions here. And what principal, why we're using principal stress is because it shows only the normal stress. There are no shear components, and this makes it really easy for us to see where the uh, the, tensile, the tensile part of the stress is and the compressive part of the stress is, which is what we're most interested in. And so let's first look at, at these, and I can kind of give a, a description of what's going on. And what we can see in this result is you can see here, uh, let me get the pointer again. We have the hip implant here and the bone here. And so these are your tensile stresses. The, the positive is tensile. The negative are the compressive stresses. And remember, on a normal bone, we would expect, um, so, so a bone, uh, a hip without, without an implant, we would expect to have compressive stress on this side, tensile on this side. And what we see is happening with this implant is that actually a lot of the, the force and the compressive stress is going into the implant and not the bone. So you can look up here and see that actually the principal stress is very close to zero. And so there's actually very little load uh, on this part of the bone. And so this was where we'll see the stress sh shielding is in this region because this, uh, this titanium stem is stiff. It's stiffer than the bone. And it's actually, uh, you can see a lot of the force is actually being transmitted in directly in, um, from the head into the, the stem. And so this will lead to bone loss, likely in this region. And the second thing I have is a displacement video. So again, we can see over the 10 time steps how the hip is moving under its load in the middle you can when it's when it's the highest displacement this is when the the foot would be hitting the ground when you're walking okay so now um, we've seen those let's have a quick look at how to set that up in the SimScale post processor so now I can see that the simulation run has finished. So the, the last step that I need to take is I need to go to the post processor. And so in the SimScale post processor, you can basically see the same results that I just showed you. And let me show you how to do that. So I'm going to first click on, let's reset this. I need to click on solution fields. This will take maybe a minute or less than that to load. And once it loads, I can see the hip in the viewer. OK, so let me turn it. And the first thing that I can show you is how to visualize the, the deformation of the hip. And so to do this, we can add a filter. It's called the warp by vector filter. And now the first thing I need to do is set this to a solid color. With some opacity so I can see through it. And so this gray um, opaque bone will be the the original uh, location of the bone. And now if I click on warp by vector, I can introduce a scale factor. So now you can see that there's, the displacement is small, which is what we expect. We don't expect to see, you know, you, you don't expect your hip to displace a lot when you're walking. You know, you don't feel any sort of displacement at all. But just to see what it looks like, we can scale it so we can get a, a bigger view of, of what the displacement looks like.
Okay, so if I zoom out, so now we can see this, this gray is the original bone, and this is the final position. And I can play this like a video, so if I click play, it sometimes takes a second to load here. But it will start at the zero position, and then it will go through the deformation as the, as the person walks, so what it would look like. You can see the deformation will, the di displacement will increase, and then it will decrease. And this is how it would be as you were taking a step. Okay, so that's a whole cycle. It goes through uh, basically a hundred, uh, ten, ten, ten steps basically. So let me stop that, and I can get rid of this warp by vector uh, filter by clicking delete filter. And so now we can look at something else, which is the principal stresses. So let me add a slice. And I need to change the direction so it's in the Y plane. And this is going to give me a cross-sectional view of the bone. So in this case I can see the implant as well as the bone and the marrow around it. And so let me change this slice to principal stress. and we're going to use principal stress 1. And so this is the maximum normal stress, and this is the main component. Um, so these will give me the largest stresses. And now I need to set my scale as well. I can auto-range it, um, but it's actually, I have some values that will give us a better uh, vis visualization. So if I put in those values, And now we can see, let me get out the ruler here as well so you can see the values that are being shown. Um, but again, it's the same concept here. You can see that a lot of the compression is actually going into the implant and not the bone. So up here especially, um, very little compression, almost zero, and all of this compression compressive force is going into the into the bone. So again, this is where we're going to see the, the stress shielding happening. And basically what will happen is if there's enough bone loss, this implant will have to be removed um, with surgery and then they'll have to do some sort of bone reconstruction before a new implant can be put in. So this is uh, this is something obviously that biomedical engineers really are working on because that's very painful for the patient to have to get a, a hip removed and or a hip implant removed and again replaced and if this happens every five to ten years then it's a, a really a bad cycle. So what biomedical engineers are doing is they're thinking maybe about using different materials. Um, so again I said you know this is this is metal, this is titanium aluminum alloy, it's very stiff. So maybe if, if we used a softer material, that might be better and, and allow for more of the force to be uh, put into this bone. And so um, there's a lot of things that uh, biomedical engineers are doing to, to research into how they can make this, this better for patients. And so that leads me into the final uh, slides. Uh, of today's session, and that's just to go over what we've learned, the key learnings in this session So, um, of, of the demonstration. So the first thing we went through is how to create a mesh. Um, so it's 
basically you're taking the, the CAD model that was uploaded and then breaking it down into smaller tetrahedrons. And this allows us to solve for the stresses and strains um, on the hip. The next is the simulation setup. So we created contacts. We assigned materials to their respective volumes and then set up the boundary conditions. And then we went through and did the post-processing. Um, so we looked at warp by vector so we can see how uh, the hip is deforming. We looked at a slice so we can look at how the principal stresses are acting on the, the bone and the implant, um, things like that. And that leads to the final slide of this session, which is uh, your homework. And so, like I said, biomedical engineers are constantly maybe looking at new materials or um, designs for a hip such as this that will um, work better and create less bone loss for the patient. And so what you're going to do is you're going to consider three different material combinations for the hip prosthesis. You're going to look at um, this first combination that I just showed you that's a metal head with a metal stem. And as we, as we saw here, this is a very stiff implant. Um, the second combination that you're going to look at is a uh, plastic, a high, high weight plastic head with a, a metal stem. And so this, this head will be less stiff since it's a plastic. And sorry about that. And the third combination that you're going to look at is um, a ceramic uh, sil or a, a ceramic uh, head and stem. And so this is less stiff than metal. So maybe you'll see a, a difference in uh, the load that is going into the, the implant compared to the bone. So this is what you're going to investigate. Um, the step-by-step -step tutorial and the recording can be found on the Biomedical Workshop page. I will send you an email that has um, uh, this, the recording of this session as well as a link to the homework in it. And so you can do this uh, over the next week um, and you can ask any questions that you might have while you're doing the homework in the forum. We have staff that are very active there that will help you. Um, and so I hope you, you learn a lot along the way uh, while you're doing this. So that kind of wraps up everything. I want to close. Uh, it looks like there are some questions uh, from users, so let's go through those briefly. Um, let's see. So Antonio asks, can you briefly explain the process with repairing a geometry for meshing? How difficult is it to repair? So Antonio, this um, will depend on your model. Uh, generally, you want to, so for example, if we have, um, you know, in this case, you could see the surfaces were all very cleaned and the contact was good between each uh, volume. So you don't want to have um, basically separations between faces. You don't want to have small, so for example, for another, you know, finite element case, maybe you have like um, an aircraft or something that has very small bolts on it or like a bridge, if it has these very small bolts, and if, 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 if these don't really affect how your simulation is running um, or where you're going to look at the stresses, then you should remove them from the model uh, and just put a simple, uh, you know, flat face or fill, fill, take out the bolts and fill, fill in where the holes would be so um, it makes it easier. Basically, the mesher will have issues if you have very small faces or um, geometry problems like that. Uh, another question is, what, uh, what are you using to reprofile the human bone? So I think this bone was actually taken from GrabCAD, um, so I'm not 100% sure how it was created, if it was scanned. Um, so that's, that's kind of a question I cannot answer for you on that. Sorry about that. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, it looks like there's some more. So 
So Fjords asks, is it necessary to include marrow into the model? The contribution of marrow to the mechanical strength of the bone is small, and removing it would allow the model to solve faster. Um, I think you might be right here. Um, I don't know how much faster it would solve, but this is kind of uh, the finesse of doing FEA. You have to decide which and this is kind of, uh, you know, differing opinions. Uh, it depends. You can test, you know, both ways and see if your results are the same. And then you, then you know that maybe you don't need to model the marrow. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is something that maybe you could explore while you're doing the, the homework if you take out the marrow and uh, notice that, that the results are different. But, I mean, another thing is you have to remember the, the stem needs to be in contact uh, as well. So... There, yeah, there, there are definitely different ways to, to model every case, and you can kind of compare uh, how the results are and, and what actually needs to be modeled, what's important in the model, and what is not so important. Uh, Banu asks, do we have the chance to compare... Oh, sorry, I lost it one second. She asked, do we have the chance to depict images of two different run results in the same window for comparison? Uh, yes, that's true. And uh, in the step-by-step -step tutorial, Banu, you're going to find um, instructions on how to do that in the SimScale viewer. Basically, we can use a transform filter so we can put all three, uh, all three different designs in one window and we can compare the results. So you'll do that during uh, the homework. Uh, okay, Carlos asks, regarding processing or computation uh, capabilities available with SimScale, you used eight processors. Could more be selected to finish sooner? Um, this is also a kind of a complex question that you would have to you would have to do some testing because what you have to remember, Carlos, is that um, you know, say instead of using eight processors, we use 32 processors, and so what you're doing is you're using some of those processors to compute everything in parallel. And so it depends on, first of all, your solver. Is the solver set up to be run in parallel? And, and also, for a relatively small problem, if you run a lot of processors in parallel, maybe it won't finish faster because those processors need to communicate the information to each other, which also takes time. So you need to scale the number of cores that you're using uh, based on the size of your mesh. Okay, let's see. And Gustavo asked, where were the material properties of bone marrow obtained? Um, so we, we obtained all these values from a paper, um, and that paper is cited in, in the homework if you want to have a closer look. Okay, I think... That is going to wrap everything up. I don't see any more questions. So I thank you guys for your time today, and I hope you enjoyed the session. And I will send an email out tomorrow with the, the homework and the recording so you can have a look and get started on that. So have a good night, and I will talk to you later.